Hi everyone, I'm Lindsay Maynard from ERC and Insight, and today I am here with Dr. Thomas Joyner. He's a professor of psychology and the director of the psychology clinic at Florida State University. So thank you so much, Dr. Joyner, for being here today. Happy to be with you. Great. So you're speaking at the ERF conference this year, and your topic is suicide. Um, in September, it's also Suicide Prevention Week. So we just wanted to take some time out to chat with you about your presentation, but also the importance of this topic. So, perfect. Um, well, let's just start out with your, your topic presentation. I know you've done a lot of research on this. So why is suicide so important? for you to research, for you to speak about um, this week? There are a couple, three reasons. One is it's a, it's a pretty massive public health problem. Um, in the United States, just to focus on our own country, we've had rising rates for many years now. Um, this year, we'll probably lose maybe more than, but approximately 50,000 of our fellow Americans to death by suicide. So it, it's a problem and it needs addressing. Uh, it's also, in addition to being an, an urgent problem um, that really affects people's lives for years and decades, in addition to that, it's also a very um, intriguing intellectual problem to try to understand why this happens. It's a mystery, it's kind of a mystery why creatures that are designed to be so self-interested do something like that and trying to solve that puzzle has been an intellectual adventure uh, but i never lose sight of the main point which is that we're losing people every day and what helps me to easily keep that point in the front of my mind is my own family history of it uh, i lost my dad to suicide 30 years ago and it still affects me to this day. And I know that happens to millions of other individuals and families. And so this work uh, is for them so that they don't have to go through what my family went through. And so that the pe people who are considering suicide don't have to go through what my dad went through. That's the whole point of the work. Yeah. That's amazing. Thank you so much for sharing that with us. Um, and you've researched the topic of suicide. And like you said, it has impacted your family so much. Is there anything that you, has surprised you while kind of uncovering um, maybe why someone would, you know, take upon themselves to commit suicide? Like what have you found to be surprising within this topic? Well, I, I mean, I think I've always had an intuitive understanding of this, but, but it certainly has become a lot clearer to me um, that actual death by suicide. Now, it's important, I think, to actually be careful with the terms. I tend to focus on death by suicide in my research program, but we also focus on things like non-lethal behaviors, talking mm -hmm. about suicide, suicidal thoughts, all of those things are, are interesting and, and clinically relevant, but they're also different from each other. In other words, talk, for example, talking about suicide or thinking about it, that's an entirely different, different thing than actually dying by suicide. And the, the distance traveled between thinking about it and actually doing it is so extensive and that difference has been interesting to me over the years about about how hard it is for people fortunately how hard it is for people to make that transition it's not surprising to me at all that it's very very hard for people to make that transition what is more surprising is that people actually manage to do it mm -hmm. and and that's what a lot of our research program has, has been focused on is how is it that people can manage to do this, this thing, which is among the most fearsome and daunting things of all. It, it's really a perplexing and, and fascinating question, and, and it's, a tra it's got tragic elements to it, to be sure, as well. Uh, and so that's been the focus of the work all along. Mm -hmm. And so in your presentation, you've kind of addressed that there are three factors that contribute to suicide. So can you share those factors with us today and kind of how you came to 
um, narrow it down to these three things? Well, the three, two of them have to do about, about you know, or, or with why somebody would, would want to, to talk about suicide or think about suicide in the first place versus the transition from, from merely thinking and talking to, to actual doing. That's what the third variable gets at. But the first two have to do with interpersonal connections to other people. Do you feel like you're connected to others or do you feel very, very lonely and, and alienated? That's one. And the second one is, do you feel like you're a burden to other people? Like your existence brings them down, detracts from their well-being in, their, in, in, the, in the present or in the future? Or on the flip side, do you feel like you contribute and that, and that you're valued? And the, the logic of the theory is, is such that if people feel both alienated and that they burden other people, then they'll develop a pretty sincere and, and severe desire for suicide. But even among that group, there's still quite a ways to travel from there to actual death. And the third variable explains how it is that people manage to translate talking and thinking into actual action about death. And that third variable has to do with being fearless, capable, able to stand very aversive things, things like physical pain, extreme physical pain, physical injury, to be able to look at death, so to speak, and stare it down, those kinds of variables. We're also interested in things like um, practical knowledge about the means, the potential means of, of suicide. You know, for instance, for someone, if you have a person who is, person A who, you know, they have a lot of suicidal desire and person B, similar, but person A knows a lot about firearms. In fact, owns several loaded in, in their bed stand, let's say, versus person B, same level of suicidal desire, but they don't know anything about guns at all. They don't own one, they never shot one, etc. Well, there's a difference in the risk level just having to do with practical access to and familiarity with a potential means of suicide. So to summarize, those are the three variables that you asked about, Lindsay. Interpersonal disconnection, feeling like you're a burden, and then third, the fearless capacity to do this very daunting thing. Mm -hmm. And insight and eating recovery center, obviously, um, a lot of patients, a lot of community members have this feeling of burdening their family members, um, being afraid to reach out and to explain what they're feeling. So how would someone who is feeling this, this burden when it comes to their family members and friends, how can one combat these feelings so they're not overwhelmed by them? It can be very overwhelming. Mm -hmm. And, and, and the, the task or the demand to all of a sudden fix all of them just makes them more overwhelming. And so you put those things together and what it suggests to me is very, very small doses of agency, of interpersonal or personal agency or, or efficacy would be another way to put that. And so just for an example would be, let's say I happen to care about a particular civic group or neighborhood group or community institution or religious institution or political organization, it doesn't matter. And then I just resolve today to do something small in support of that organization or, or, or institution. And I resolve to do that most days, more days than not. It could be very, 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 very small. Turns out that if you start from small things like that and, and keep them going over days and days and days and weeks and weeks and weeks, Human nature is such that it just starts to pick up momentum, grow, blossom, and then our natural draw or pull towards feeling efficacious, like we have an effect on other people in the world, like we mean something, that just tends to kick in, but not before quite a bit of effort and discipline and patience uh, has, you know, quite a bit of that's required 
So to bring people into that process of step by step by step, day by day by day, rebuilding uh, a sense of agency. Okay. And so something that I'm kind of hearing and also just, you know, in our world today, isolation is really challenging for many people. And um, for many of us, we've been in isolation for months and many people still are. And those dealing with depression and anxiety, isolation can feel even more damaging. So can you talk about kind of uh, the effect of isolation and how that can kind of contribute to this yeah, isolation, we're not, we're just not built for it. I mean, literally our, our nervous systems, the architecture of it, the structure of it, the neurobiology of it simply was not built for that. And, and so when we're exposed to it, it's no wonder that things go wrong. Um, you, you, you build any complex system under a, a particular condition or for a condition, particular condition, and then you take that complex system out of that condition, things are going to go wrong. It's only, only natural. And that happens with us when it comes to isolation. And the way to buffer against that or mitigate that, even under conditions of a pandemic, I think it's the same rule. And it's that step-by-step, small-dose feeling of some connection. Is, is a connection like over Zoom as much or as good or however you want to put it? as a face-to-face -face interaction? Probably not, I don't know. For some people it might be, for others probably not. For most people probably not, but it's something. And so that, that's sort of consistent with the logic is that, you know, that small bits, small doses, they really add up if people are, are determined to do them over time and let them accumulate. Mm. So with everything going on in the world right now, I mean, are you seeing a higher rate of suicide deaths at the moment? Is this kind of a season where that tends to rise or fall or just kind of talk about that? Well, I mean, it's hard to say is, is one bottom line of, of that. One, there are a couple things though that, that are pretty clear. One is that, the, the, that there has been a rise as, as compared to like a year ago, let's say. So, you know, the, the, let's take May to, to August, for instance, of 2019 and compare it to May to August of this year. And there's no question that there's been a rise in things like depression and anxiety and, and thinking about suicide. Again, crucial to distinguish thinking about suicide from actually dying by suicide. Because there, it's not clear. It's too early to tell and, and actually, if I had to predict it right now, I don't, I don't expect there to be a huge surge in suicide deaths. It's possible. It's possible because that happens anyway. Every May, June, July in the Northern Hemisphere, that's the, the annual peak every year. And so this year, that peak is corresponding to a pandemic, which you know, has all sorts of risk factors built into it. Um, like isolation, we talked about that, but also just the stress and anxiety of it. Things like, you know, maybe people cooped up in circumstances that are not particularly healthy or that may be really toxic. People are buying a ton more guns under this pandemic. That's not necessarily a good thing to add into that mix. A lot more alcohol to boot. So it's a dangerous mixture. So it wouldn't shock me if we saw a, a surge in actual deaths, mm -hmm. but I kind of doubt it. And it's because of a couple things. One is that people are resilient and strong under, anyway, but especially under conditions like this, where you know a lot of our good side comes out. We rally together and we help each other and we, we're kinder to one another. And that's, that's all to the good. And then the other thing I would say is that it might be the case that people are getting a deeper appreciation of life and of, of health mm -hmm. because of this threat. Anytime that you value life more or your health more, I view that as an anti-suicide you know, anti antidote kind of. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, so I don't think we're going to see a huge surge in deaths, maybe a, maybe a small one, but we certainly have seen a surge in, in, in things like depression, suicidal ideation. Mm -hmm. Okay. So Dr. Joyner, you talk about um, in kind of phases of, of talking about suicide to someone actually committing suicide. Um, and you've mentioned self-harm in kind of this uh, in your presentation. And so where does self-harm fit into that? Um, what is your research around self-harm? Well, a couple things to say about that. One is that at, at the moment of self-harm during a particular episode, most people don't have on their minds, they don't have death or anything like it on their minds. That, that's not the point of non-suicidal self-injury. In fact, that's why it's called non-suicidal self-injury. Um, the point is different. Their, their point is to feel differently. You know, if you're feeling, if you're feeling really terrible um, in one way or another, and then if, it turns out that if you purposefully hurt yourself, that will change your feeling. It's not a good way to do it, of course, and it has all sorts of you know negative consequences. But but it also does have that actual effect. That's why people do that um, to change their feelings. Relevant to suicide, though, is that it's a facilitator. Non-suicidal self-injury, especially if severe and frequent, is a facilitator potentially of that fearlessness and capacity that I talked about a minute ago. Um, the idea being that you have to be fearless and capable to actually do this daunting and fearsome thing. Non-suicidal self-injury facilitates that quality by teaching people that they can injure the self and be, be you know, all right, that they can tolerate it, that they can even get used to it. And there's, there's research evidence from us and for others that are pretty consistent with that story. Okay. So back to um, anxiety and even depression, like you said, there's kind of been an uptick in anxiety and depression during the pandemic. Um, at what stage when someone is experiencing either these new feelings of anxiety, depression, or just, you know, a heavier feeling, at what point should they be asking for help? Should they be reaching out when, um, you know, it becomes something very serious? I mean, it's a little bit of a hard question to answer because something like depression, it occurs along such a, such a, you know, wide spectrum mm -hmm. that it can be a little tough to say exactly when along that spectrum someone should reach out. But just in the spirit of, you know, safety and an abundance of caution, I would do it sooner rather than later and lower on the spectrum. I mean, one way to think about it is if you're just feeling different on the main parameters of things like mood, energy, sleep, appetite, ability to concentrate. Uh, of course, that's going to vacillate very day to day just in the natural course of events. But if you find that in a sustained way, you're just different now across those parameters, I think I would talk with someone about that. And a couple of great options in that regard that I think people tend to overlook a little bit too much. One are family physicians, primary care physicians. They see, they see everything, including this, all the time. And they can prescribe medications that, um, you know, are often, not always, but are often very helpful for these problems. Uh, another option would be, it kind of depends on your religious, you know, persuasion, but clergy of various religious institutions, they see a lot of this kind of human misery and suffering in, in life. And they get pretty good at, at, at steering people through them and pointing to resources in the local community. So I'd reach out to someone like that. Um, and there's a lot of other examples too, mental health professionals, friends, family for support, those kinds of things. Last thing I'll say about that is that I, I mentioned that spectrum of depression. Once suicidal thinking, gets in the mix, it's time to call the doctor. It's, it's, I mean, I'm not talking about necessarily 911 or the ER, but once you start having suicidal thoughts, that's clearly an indication that this depression has progressed to a level that needs some clinical attention. In other words, it's not just normal day-to-day -day blues when you're thinking about suicide. Right, yeah, thank you for that. 
So thinking about your research studying, um, does genetics play a role in things like anxiety, depression, and even suicide? And are there um, particular ethnic groups that um, are at greater risk for these things? There, there, there are, is a role for genes. Um, that, that, that much is pretty clear. Um, we don't really know that much about which genes. That, that's a frontier of, of ongoing research. But we just know from, from studying families and from studying identical twins and non-identical twins that um, things like anxiety, depression, uh, suicidal thinking, and death by suicide all have some genetic component. Um, that, that, that piece is very clear. It's also very clear that it's not 100% genetic, not, not by any stretch. But, but there's a definite genetic component. These problems run in families, no doubt about it. Um, and they run in families, at least in part, because of the shared genes that the family has. You asked about ethnic differences. They're really interesting and, and pronounced ethnic differences in this domain. And they're a little bit surprising the way, it, the patterning of it. The, the most at-risk groups, and this has not changed for decades, uh, and this is risk for death by suicide. It's a little bit different when you talk about suicide attempts, non-lethal suicide attempts, and suicidal ideation. But the clearest picture is on suicidal death. And it clusters in Native American people and in Caucasian people, people of Caucasian descent. And the rates are really low in African American people, Hispanic people, uh, Asian American people. Those two ethnic groups that I mentioned first, they have by far the most deaths by suicide. Mm. At the same time, it's also true that, that the death rate is starting to climb in African American people, for example. That, that's worrying and that's a public health issue that deserves serious attention. It's also important to, to state that despite that noticeable increase, the rates among African Americans um, still is not anywhere close to what it is, for example, in, in Native American people. Mm, that's really interesting. So thinking about younger generations, a lot of our community members and social media followers and such um, are in those younger generations. Have you seen um, any correlation with technology having to play a part in suicide? There's so many videos out there and images. Is there anything that you're seeing there? There, there is a, a, a very robust, controversial, ongoing scholarship uh, on these questions. I, I'm part of that um, group of scholars working on this. Um, so what I would say is that first of all, it's, pretty controversial and, and there are differing views about, about this. My mm -hmm. own view, and this is just my own view, is that there are both very, very good things about social media and very, very bad things. Just like with almost any innovation in communication technology ever. You know, it's the same story. Um, I, I would say that the good things about social media are connecting people to each other. Um, yes, I think it's a little bit of a, a pale version to, to connect over video as compared to connecting face to face, but it's still a connection. And that's a good thing. Connection is a good thing. But, but dangerous, you know, imagery, you know, sites and resources that encourage suicide. Um, those are, those are an atrocity. And, and so, you know, I don't, that's the bad side. The, the other thing I would say about it, and this is very timely given the pandemic conditions, is that if you're spending hours and hours and hours looking at a screen, it's not so much what you are doing that, that, that could be the problem as, as what you're not doing. It means you're not outside. That means you're not exercising, moving around, um, you know, things like that. If, if, you're, if you go too long into the night, it means you're not sleeping when you should be, you know, things like that. So I'm not so worried about screen time per se. I'm worried about the activities that screen time is replacing because those are those activities are real important to our to our basic health. Yeah. 
definitely. So if someone um, has a family member or a friend who is maybe, you know, speaking of social media, there have been a lot of stories out there about people who are, um, you know, announcing that they're going to end their life or that they're thinking about it. So what can someone do um, to help that person? Should they, you know, make a quick call to 911? Should they reach out, you know, to that person personally? So what should someone do? It kind of depends on the example or the situation, but reaching out, uh, that that seems pretty that seems like a kind of one size fits all situation there there are definitely ones that are so dangerous or dangerous seeming that yeah a, a call to nine one one is definitely in order but for most of them just a simple reaching out seems to me the thing to do um you know, people wring their hands and get all tied up in knots about, oh, is that going to be the right thing? Are they going to like it? Am I infringing on their mm. autonomy? You know, things like that. I would, I would advise people not to get, you know, too tied up about stuff like that. And because it very, very rarely happens, what far more happens is, is either, you know, false alarm, it turns out, or, yeah, thank you for reaching out. I really needed that. You know, that's, that's what you tend to get. So that's what I would, I would encourage. And the provision of resources. These days are really good free resources, all, you know, available. On the, on the, you know, the internet, we mentioned some good things and some bad things about the internet. One of the good things is the website of um, the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline. If you just Google, if you just Google in 273 talk, 800-273-8255, talk, 800-273-talk. That's the number of the lifeline. And if you call that number anywhere, you'll get, you know, crisis resources that are, that are solid. Mm -hmm. And then if you Google that, it'll take you to their website and there's even more resources there. There's organizations like the Crisis Text Line. If you just Google that, I actually think it's crisis text line, one word, dot org very accessible you know for people who would rather text about something so resources like that can be really helpful to know about because when you reach out you've got some tools to offer mm -hmm. okay. great yeah, um, got some dogs barking in the background so that's okay this is our new normal huh <laughs> so uh, in September is suicide prevention week um, this is kind of a, a big question but how can we prevent suicide? Can we prevent suicide? Um, you know, is this something that, you know, that we can prevent, that we can help stop and bring it, bring it into? It is a big question, but I, I do have some thoughts. And, and one is that um, there's, a, there's an example, recent example of our, our friends and colleagues in Japan doing um, a great job of turning the tide of a really serious suicide problem. Mm -hmm. They've had rates going down for two or three, four years now, very noticeably in Japan, whereas ours during the exact same time frame have, have worryingly increased relentlessly. What are they doing different would be the main question. And it's not really rocket science what they did different. It, it, it was just a nationwide implementation of common sense. For example, crisis resources should be ubiquitous and very, very available. So should healthcare treatment, including mental health care treatment. And in that treatment, things like depression screening, suicide screening, treatment for the, these problems should be readily available. Um, people should be safe, safer with the means, potential means of suicide, really common sense, things like that. Turns out when you institute those far and wide in a really deep way, turns the tide. They also do not have some of the challenges we have. We have an opioid problem in the United States, and Japan doesn't struggle with that nearly as much. And so we're, we're, we're in the U.S., we're swimming upstream, so to speak, against those kinds of forces. 
our, our fascination with violence is not, I mean, I actually think it's better for work. It, it's for better and worse. I mean, the rugged, American rugged individualism is something that I actually am all for, but, but I also acknowledge that it has a dark side and that, you know, this fascination with violence is one of them and, and that's not helping in terms of suicide prevention. So just being more careful and more safe about those kinds of things, I think would, would help a lot. Last thing I would say is that I, I do believe that in principle, every single death by suicide is preventable in principle. I, I believe that every single one. I also am very familiar with the practical reality that some are way harder to prevent than others. And some are so hard to prevent that our technology is just not there yet. But that doesn't mean that they weren't preventable. It just means that our technology needs to catch up. And then in principle, it was preventable. That, that's my particular view about that. Okay. Thank you so much for sharing. So one last question, Dr. Joyner, and um, this kind of goes out to our community and our patients and alum. Is there hope when someone is struggling with feeling like suicide is their only option? Um, what hope do they have to to find recovery, to find healing, and to not be struggling with that every day? There's there's no question that that hope and thriving and positive outcomes are possible. There's no doubt about it. There are examples of it um, every day. There are uh, research programs that have documented as much um, there and there are treatments that while imperfect do affect these mental disorders that tend to spur a lot of suicidal phenomena. Uh, and, and so a trust in that and also a, an acceptance of the imperfection of the treatment, meaning that there's going to have to be a little bit of patience because maybe that first treatment won't kick in, or maybe it won't until it's at a higher intensity or a higher dose or, or whatever the case may be. That, that can be frustrating to have patience with something that really is making you miserable. That can, be, that can be very frustrating, but there is hope in terms of getting better and in terms of the treatments that are available. And there are examples of that hope and of that thriving post-suicide attempt, post suicide crisis that I think are inspiring examples. And, and I would also remind people of the devastation, the, the utter devastation left in the wake in the aftermath of these deaths. It, it, it marks people, and not just for a little while, for years and decades, and it reverberates throughout families and throughout generations. It, it, it's a very, very, very harsh penalty to impose on oneself and on one's family and friends for generations, especially when there, there, there's a way out. It may not seem like it, but there is. Thank you so much for sharing that. Um, great, well, thank you so much for talking with us today. We really appreciate it. And um, yeah, this was inspirational and you know, it's, it's great to know that there is hope and that that's not the only option at all. It should be an option. Um, so thank you. Thanks for joining us and we appreciate you. Okay, you're welcome. Thank you.